Uh, we're in a passage this morning that uh, when I start reading it, you're going to have a couple of thoughts. One is, what does this got to do with anything? Because we're going to talk about what, what meat was allowed to be eaten and not allowed to be eaten back in uh, the um, early church. And uh, there are some people in the room that are going to go, yeah, that's one of the things that bugs me about Christianity. Where does Christianity get off telling me what I'm allowed to eat, what I'm not allowed to eat? And so uh, when I read through this, don't get lost in the we don't deal with this anymore concept. There's actually an issue that we will deal with all the time as believers that Paul uses this illustration to help reveal to us. And so it starts in the eighth chapter. It says, now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, and indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us nearer to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Now, some of you are going to take that verse of Scripture out of context and post it on your refrigerator and excuse everything you do or don't do, and that's not what it's about. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way, you wound their weak conscience and you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Well, it's a challenging passage of Scripture. I don't know how you were raised. I was raised in a very strict religious environment. Do we have any other victims in the house? Just, yeah. I don't, I mean, almost everything was a sin. I'm not making it up. We did not have a TV, not because it was not a wise use of your time. It was a sin. Uh, women were not permitted to wear jewelry because it was a sin. A deck of cards, sin. Secular music, sin. Dancing, really big sin. Uh, just everything, everything, everything was a sin. They had, they had standards for how women wore their hair and their clothes and just everything. And... Uh, and when you're raised in that kind of environment, uh, life can be pretty restrictive. And I have some pretty embarrassing stories about that I prefer not to share. But we have, we've grown a lot over our lives. The challenge about this kind of approach is that often we focus on people's behavior because it's the easiest thing to observe. I can see what you do, but I actually can't read your mind or know what's in your heart. And there are people who can actually do good things for less than good reasons. You see, people who are good at the rules game can look really good, even though there's some pretty dark stuff going on inside. For example, a person might look very generous when, in fact, all they're really trying to do is manage their image so that others will think well of them. Or some people might appear to be frugal and conservative in their spending when, in fact, they're just stingy and they don't want to let go of anything they've earned. And there are some people that can appear to be so concerned about others, what they're really doing is gossiping 
or there's some people that have bitterness that has taken root in their heart, but it doesn't look like that. It looks like justice. The right thing needs to be done. Why is this important for us to think about? Because God understands that he's not just after our behavior. He's after our heart. If he gets our heart, he gets all of us. He's not just looking for compliant people who are programmed to stay inside the boundaries of appropriate behavior. He wants to capture our heart. There's this great passage in 1 Samuel where it says, the Lord does not look at things uh, people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. That's what God looks at. So Paul is now turning his pastoral insight and wisdom into dealing with two groups that were in the church. And actually, one of these groups is the rules group. You don't eat meat that's been offered to sacri or sacrificed to an idol. They had all these rules, and there's another group. They've got all these rights, and they're allowed to do almost anything. And Paul actually uses terms for each group, and it's going to appear as though he's choosing sides. And he's not actually. He's identifying significant things about each group. And this is what's fascinating, is that Paul does not attack either group. Paul does not speak harshly about either group, and Paul actually shows how both groups are actually committing the same sin. They just don't realize it. It's a fascinating conversation. So he describes the rule group as weak. Here's the thing about rule people. They do not consider themselves weak. They think other people who are not able to keep the rules are weak. And if you tell a rule person, you're just weak they will not take that kindly, all right? And uh, if you are a rule person, you don't, I think you don't even have to be a rule person. No one, no one wants to be called weak. What does he mean by that? He means that they have trouble understanding grace. For them, it seems like something that is not realistic. They also are consistently feeling condemned in their own thoughts. They constantly feel like they're not measuring up. Their conscience is often at war with them. They just feel bad, like there's something wrong with them. And they're often anxious about issues that we would call gray areas. And we learned last week there's a lot of gray in our world. So how do we manage that? And they often ask for clarification. They just want to know, is this right or is this wrong? Because they want to stay on the correct side of the line. So Paul identifies them as being a weak group, and then he identifies the rights group as being strong. What makes them strong? Well, they're not superstitious. They don't think that if meat has been in a temple, that somehow it got contaminated with some spiritual residue, and now if you eat it, it will force the grace of God out of your life. They're, they're not superstitious people. They're also not legalistic. They don't think that the way you establish your relationship with God is by the works that you do for him. And they tend not to be anxious about gray areas. They say, well, let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. Let's make a wise choice. And they feel reasonably confident in their faith and their relationship with God. Now, as soon as you hear Paul say, one group is weak and the other group is so strong, you might think he's saying one group is right and the other group is wrong. And that's actually not what he's saying. He identifies what the real problem. And the real problem is not what's at, on the menu. The real problem is who's not at the table. He begins to focus on some very powerful things. How you treat each other is more important than what you eat. How you treat each other is more important than what you eat. Each group has become unaccepting of the other group. The rules tribe, they're withdrawing from those who feel comfortable eating meat that was used in a pagan ritual. When they see meat, they just they, they, they are reminded of pagan ritual. Let me give you a little bit of a background so you understand why this was such a big deal to them. In the ancient world, they didn't eat as much meat as we do. Uh, we can just go, you can drive through a fast food restaurant and get meat at a terrifying, at least they call it meat, at a terrifyingly fast pace. And you can go into a supermarket and get all kinds of, in the ancient world, it wasn't that readily available, especially if you were poor. In fact, if you were poor in Corinth, the only meat you ever got in your life was meat that you had when you were participating in a pagan ritual in a pagan temple. You couldn't afford meat. So the only time you got it was there. So, 
You might think, well, what's the big deal about that? There were things that actually occurred in those rituals that if they were to happen in our country today, people would be arrested. I mean, we think that, that our society is, is, is blown through all the boundaries of appropriate behavior towards each other. I am telling you, if people did today what people did then, they would be arrested. They would go to jail for that behavior. And here's what's happening. When they see another believer eating meat, for them, it is like a form of PTSD. They see that person eating meat and they flash back, not only to what they have participated in that they feel badly about, but they might be tempted to re -enter enter again. And so when they see you chowing down on your steak, they're just, they're having a form of PTSD and they feel condemned. Now the strong, they're withdrawing from the rules tribe, but for a very different reason. You see, the strong, they could afford to buy meat. They didn't have to participate in a pagan ritual to get it. Those pagan rituals, when they had leftover meat, they would try to capitalize on whatever their profits could be. So they would put it out in the market to sell. And if you were a wealthy person, you could afford meat. And by the way, they also understood that they didn't need to participate in a ritual to get it. And they had more knowledge. They understood more about the grace of God. They had the kind of leisure available to them to involve themselves in more teaching so that they would understand the grace of God better. So what they started doing, they started saying, you know, the rules group of people, they're, they're narrow-minded, they're bigoted, they're prejudicial, they're, they're naive, they're simplistic, and I am not spending my time with a representation of Christianity like that. And they would withdraw from the table. And what Paul tells them is you do have more knowledge, but you do not have more love. Now, in case you're sitting here thinking, well, you know, that was them. We don't do things like that. Let's just pick apart a little bit what judgmentalism looks like and signs of being judgmental. You keep your distance. You just keep your distance. We don't want to get too close to some people. Here's the question to ask yourself in your life. When you are avoiding somebody, why? Why? Every time we avoid people, we are making a judgment. Every time we distance ourselves from people, we are making a judgment. Secondly, as judgmentalism tries to control those who think differently. We try to control their behavior. That's, that's what the, the rules people would do. So they just they try to create more rules. And how many know if you've been around religious environments very long, the list of rules can get very long, right? I have conversations with uh, spiritual leaders all over the state about these, excuse me, these kinds of things. And what I tell them is we're never going to come up with a comprehensive list because as it turns out, sinners are very creative. They can get, you can make a rule, and they will work around. They'll find a way. They do. And so the issue, once again, is not just external behavior. It's going after the heart. So they just keep making rules. And then, on top of the rules, there are people who are not keeping the rules, so they want to make the punishments harsher. And uh, I'll, I'll have people that will come to me as a pastor, and they'll say, Pastor, there's someone attending the church, and, and they're living outside the boundaries of acceptable behavior according to Scripture. You should kick them out of the church until they get their act together. And I just asked them, if I were to do that, and we were to remove them from an environment of grace and remove them from a place where they can actually be instructed by the truth of God's word, what hope is there for change in their life? Because now you've removed them from everything that can be an influence for the gospel. So, that's people on the the rule side, that's how they try to control. But you might think those, those rights people, they don't try to control anybody. In fact, that's kind of their motto, isn't it, right? I don't try to control anybody, and nobody's going to control me. Well, that's not exactly true. Uh, they will be very unaccepting of environments where there are any standards or regulations or rules. And if you try to impose it on them, they'll just say, no, I'm not going to do that. And so it creates a challenge. So what are we supposed to do if, if judgmental is not our, the correct approach? What is the correct approach? And Paul tells us that if we value relationships over rights, we're going to have to learn to accept each other. Accept each other. Now, this is where people get really frustrated. And there's some of you in this room right now that are starting to feel tension. And you're going, I, I am not going to, and this is the word you think accept means, I am not going to approve of their behavior. 
And here's what you have to understand. Acceptance is not the same thing as approval. To accept a person doesn't mean that you approve of what they do. Aren't you glad that God, even though he didn't approve of the way we lived our lives, still accepted us in Christ because he knew the relationship with him would have a transforming influence over time? Let me give you an example of this. It says in Romans, the 14th chapter, accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. This is not a slam at vegetarians or vegans. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For who? God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Okay? God calls us to learn to be accepting of people. Why is everyone welcome here in this place? Because everyone matters to God. That's why. And we don't require that you are a perfect person before you get in the room. In fact, we don't even require that you're three-quarters perfect. And some of you that think you've established that measure of perfection, um, we could probably find some things about you that you would prefer no one knew. We often only accept those who agree with us. And here's what we need to know. Rejection has never influenced anyone for the better. Rejection only makes you more of what you already are. I honestly believe that the grace of God and the truth of his word is so incredibly powerful that I think that anybody who's exposed to it over time is going to have their life changed by it. So how can we be more accepting? Well, try to understand how other people think. Don't just argue with them. How did they get to that position? It doesn't mean you agree with them. It doesn't mean that you support their position. It doesn't mean that you approve of what they do. Just how did they get there? That's very, it's a good exercise for us to work through mentally. And then try to establish a relationship with someone. And this is a little bit challenging. Our culture is not good at this. We don't establish relationships with people who think differently than we do. Our culture right now is more divided than any time I've ever seen in my lifetime. And historians tell me it ranks right up there with some of the worst of all time. And do you know what the primary reason is? It is not what we think it is. It is because the church has lost its influence in our culture. And when the church has influence in our culture, we don't require everyone to think exactly like us to be able to have a relationship with them. It's the absence of, of a Christian influence that's actually driving our division in our culture. And we also have to be willing to inconvenience ourselves. There's no way you can establish relationship with someone who thinks differently or acts differently than you if, if, if you just only do it when it's convenient. It will never be convenient for it. Now, the weak can be more susceptible to peer pressure. This is something that we don't realize because they often appear and talk as though they're strong. But the, the rules-oriented organizations, actually, they use peer pressure to get compliance. And Paul identifies in this passage that when a person is susceptible to peer pressure, they may actually do something that they're going to regret later. For example, let's suppose that you're a, a Corinthian believer and you're in the rights group, so you feel like you are stronger, and you've got a friend, you've actually established a relationship, and, and they're in the rules group, and they don't think that they're supposed to eat meat that's been offered to an idol. And so so there you are with your juicy hamburger, and you keep trying to stick it in the face. Come on, go ahead, eat it. It's not bad. It's good. You'll love it. Taste it. And nothing bad will happen. Look, I've had a lot of them. I'm fine. Just And you keep doing that. And you know what? That person may succumb to your request, not because they think it's okay, but because they feel the pressure you are imposing on them. And before the bite of hamburger hits their stomach, their heart, and their mind will feel condemned. See, this is a big challenge for the rights group, is that the rights group has a tendency to want to impose rights on people who aren't ready to live out those rights. All those things just feel bad to them. And so Paul says, we have to think about this. We have to understand that, that there are weaknesses that are built into this system. So, uh, let's give another example here. Uh, I grew up 
in a, in a house where all secular music was bad. I, I remember when one Christmas, I was just a very little boy, and, and a, a little, my mother bought a, a, little, a little record, a, a little 45, remember what those are way back? It's, it's like an 8-track, only completely different. <laughs> and so, and, and it was Puff the Magic Dragon. Yeah. And my dad said, that's the beginning of compromise in this house, because that's what he believed. Turns out he was right. <laughs> That's another story. Um. <laughs> but anyways, so let's suppose that you have a friend who, who doesn't feel comfortable with secular music. And let's suppose that you're trying to extend yourself. You're trying to understand them. You're, you're inconveniencing yourself. You, you actually invite them over to your house for lunch. So what music are you going to put on your playlist? And if you're the kind of person that says, well, if they're in my house, they're going to listen to what I play. If they don't like it, they can get out. Okay. Now we know. It's not, that's not about establishing a relationship. Are you really saying that even for that period of time, you can't alter your playlist? Because this is what I will tell you. If we are so insistent that we have to exercise our rights, maybe they've stopped being rights and they've started being bondages. There's a difference between saying, can I do something? And should I do something? So have them over to the house, and what if, if, they, if there's Christian music that they, that's the only thing they can listen to? Why not put it on? Who is being harmed by that? But it's difficult for us. Uh, if you want to value relationships over your rights, adjust your preferences for the sake of the relationship. That's what I just said. So you're going to put on some different music while they're there. You know, if you are, if you are a, a vegetarian or a vegan and you come over to our house, uh, I might still eat meat in front of you, uh, but I'm not going to force you to eat it. I'm not going to put a bloody red steak on your plate and say either eat it or get out. I mean, that's just not nice. And so this is the thing. You don't have to try to impose something on someone else. Is this making sense? So you can alter your preferences and then respect the pace of God's work in others' lives. You see, they're not going to get to where you are just because you had a brilliant insight or a strong argument. This is what's true about me in my life. I'm an incredibly slow learner in my pursuit of God. I feel like I am I'm decades behind where I should be. And I see other people that seem to outpace me in their capacity to understand significant spiritual truth. And it has been a source of frustration in my life. But here's what we need to understand. God does not reject us just because it takes us a little longer to learn something. He just keeps working with us, and he keeps investing in us. Aren't you glad he doesn't withdraw his relationship from us just because we don't measure up to somebody else? So that's what we have to learn. Don't get frustrated at the pace of God's work in someone else's life. And then expect to be misunderstood. Because you're going to be. They're going to make statements about you that are not accurate and they are not true, but they will make them because it's how they think. And here's the thing. So let's suppose um, you, you have this uh, uh, meal at your house. It's a lunch and you have somebody over it. And, and, and you've, you've got the, the, the Christian music playing for them. And uh, what's a Christian group that someone likes? Let me hear. What is it? Mercy Me. Mercy Me. And so Mercy Me is playing, and, and, uh, and this person is just enjoying lunch so much, and they're talking to you. Oh, this is, this, is, <laughs> this is great. I'm so glad I came here today. And, and then they say, you know, I, I, I thought you were one of those people who would listen to secular music. I am so glad you're not one of them. And... Uh, Paul does not say you should say to that person, yeah, I would never be one of them. Don't lie. As soon as they're out of the house, you're going to have your Grateful Dead record right now trying, <laughs> trying to make up for lost time. You know, just, I, I know how some of you work. You just, they'll hear it. You play it loud, too. And Paul is not saying you have to pretend. He doesn't say you have to lie. He doesn't say you have to agree with them. You just say, you know what, honestly... I don't think that secular music necessarily has a detrimental effect on people who listen to it. I think it can on some, but not everybody. And I chose not to play that while you were here because I wanted to honor you. I, I value your relationship. I value your friendship. 
And so I wanted to do that while you were here. But I actually wouldn't be critical of someone who, who listens to different groups. And that person might completely misunderstand you, but you have to be willing to do that. Paul's not saying that we cannot accurately assess something or that we have to hide what we think about it. That's part of what's wrong with our culture right now. We just yell all over each other. We don't have conversations. And Paul says that's, that's not how to go about it. In fact, um, it's not wrong to evaluate. Here's what's wrong. It's wrong when you feel superior for the position that you have. I'm actually a better, more noble, more intelligent, more devoted Christian than someone else because of what I know. That, that's not healthy. Or it's also wrong to take the light when they fail at whatever their position was. You know, the real rule keeper, and they're really strong on all of this stuff, and then all of a sudden you find out that their life just got blown up because they made some kind of decision that was morally or ethically unwise, and, and you just, don't, don't we have a chance to do that? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not surprised. They're all like that. And you're taking delight in another person's failure. By the way, you think that only happens for rural people, but uh, towards rural people, but it's not. Because a rural person can look at a rights person, and when some freedom in their life becomes a dominating, controlling behavior, actually becomes a form of bondage, maybe they have to seek out rehab or rehabilitation in some way to, to correct or deal with this issue in their life. They go, yeah, see, I, I tried to tell them. And you're taking delight in their failure. That's not healthy. It's never good to see someone struggling and think better of ourselves and actually take delight in it. So if they're caught in a behavior, pray for them. And that's how we can make a difference in someone else's life. Now, uh, the common tendency is for us to think that we're either better or worse because of things we do or don't do. And the common tendency is for people to feel either qualified or disqualified for a relationship with God based on their past. And here's what I want you to know. It is not our past that qualifies us or disqualifies us for a relationship with God. It's Christ's past that qualifies us. He's the one who had all the rights, and he set them aside. And he came to us while we were still sinners. And people didn't take to him very well. In only three and a half years of ministry, they ended it with a brutal murder. But even in that, he continued to offer forgiveness, and he paid the price so that we could be free for eternity. This is what we need to appreciate. If we are withdrawing, if we are separating from people, it doesn't matter which tribe you're in. You're actually engaged in something that's going to fracture the church and diminish our ability to be an influence for others. Let's bow our heads this morning. I think um, probably there's some people right now thinking thoughts like, you know, but Bible, doesn't the Bible call us to be separate and doesn't the Bible say, you know, bad fr friends corrupt good behavior and, and, and the Bible does say all of that. But all of that separation is based on your weakness, not someone else's. If something is going to be tempting for you, then maybe there's some people you do need to distance yourself from. But wouldn't it be an incredible testimony to say to them, you know, maybe this is something you can handle in your life and that's fine. But for me, I've been here before and uh, it gets a hold of me and I, I can't handle it. And so... I'm not going to participate in that. What an amazing testimony of humility instead of just trying to look down on someone and saying, I shouldn't be connected with you in any way because I'm better. Because none of us are. Every single one of us needed a supreme sacrifice. Every single one of us needed the grace of God in our lives. And without it, we would be lost. We're not better than others. We're just grateful for what God is doing in our lives. Father,
for those of us who have issues in our lives that maybe you want to address, would you help us today not to hear it as condemnation? And would you also help us to understand that just because you're dealing with us doesn't mean we have to make it a rule for everybody else? Would you help us find ways to try to connect with others who, even though they think very differently, they are still your child and you are doing amazing work in their lives? And maybe you will use them to influence us, and maybe you will use us to influence them. But at the end of the day, we will give a testimony of your grace and your gospel to the world because you are doing great things in our lives. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stand with me this morning.